I have a job you don't want to have. I evaluate and treat sex offenders as part of my practice as a psychologist. That includes serial child rapists, adult sexual abusers, and people designated by the state of Washington as sexually violent predators. Nobody likes sex offenders. Even gang members and murderers don't like sex offenders. Sex offenders are the people who are most likely to be physically and sexually abused in incarceration. They're the last people you want in your community. And that is exactly why I think we need to talk about them. Because the way that we think and act toward the people that we fear and dislike the most says something about us as a society. So I'd like to talk about some of our fears and which ones are true and which ones aren't. Because fear has a tremendous amount to do with how we live our daily lives. The thing that I think causes us the most fear and distress when we think about child sexual abuse is the idea of a child being abducted by a stranger and abused, and rightly so for invoking that fear. We have about 74 million minors in the United States, and I'd like you to just take a guess for how many child abductors by strangers there are each year. I'm guessing you said probably several thousand or tens of thousands, and here's the real number. It's about 100. When we think about child sexual abuse, we automatically go to the stranger danger scenario. We spend a tremendous amount of time taking care of our children and keeping them from direct physical harm. We escort them to the school bus station stop, and we stay there until the bus arrives. We plan play dates and so that they, we know where they're going, and we drop them off, but we don't give our children the chance to go down the street to see if their friends Emily and Jacob are free to play. This is not what happens in a lot of the rest of the world. In much of the rest of the world, they raise their children like we did in, the Ameri in America in the 60s and 70s, using what we would think of as free-range parenting techniques. When you look at the statistics of children who are declared missing by law enforcement, less than 1% of those children have been abducted by strangers. The vast majority of child abductions are done by parents who have lost custody of their children and want the possession back. I don't want to underestimate how horrible child abduction by stranger is. I can't think of anything worse that could possibly have to a family or happen to a family or child. But the branch of the US Department of Justice that keeps statistics on sex offenders will tell you that the perpetrator, of the perpetrators of sexual abuse, 90% of them are known to the child before the abuse happens. 30% of them are family, 60% are friends and neighbors. Only 10% of them are strangers. This tells us that the model of stranger danger doesn't hold up. You have far more to be concerned about with the other people who are in your children's lives if you don't know them well than you have from strangers. This brings up a question to me. Are we catastrophizing with the worst case but extraordinarily rare scenario rather than letting our children learn a lot of lessons of independence. What is the choice that we are making as a society about this issue? The internet is changing the way that we also think about sex offenses. One of the biggest issues that I and other treatment providers are running into is that about 20% of teenagers are sending nude selfies to each other. That's actually one of the first steps they have in getting to know each other in hookup culture. So the way it typically works is that a young teenage male is going to send a nude picture of themselves to someone and then request a picture back, and sometimes they will get one back and sometimes they won't. But that means that they are now involved in production of child pornography, transmission of child pornography, and possession of child pornography. And furthermore, if one person is in Vancouver, Washington, and their friend is across the Columbia River in Portland, Oregon, it's now interstate and you've got federal charges. Now, if you talk to one of these teenagers and say, would you drop your pants in public and let everybody see your, what you've got? They'd probably say, no, of course not. And then they get really confused when you say, okay, well then why is this okay to do electronically? So the thing is that the nature of what we're now thinking about as sex offenses is changing rapidly in the past 20 years because of the advent of the internet. So why do sex offenses matter to us as a community? The answer is the numbers themselves. 
These numbers are from the Centers of Disease Control. Their estimation is that by the age of 18, one in six boys and one in four girls have somehow been sexually abused. They also estimate that 18% of all adult women have been raped, and only 16% of rapes are actually reported to law enforcement. 75% of rapists are known to the, the adult women who are raped. And what this says is that a lot of our conceptualizations of how sexual abuse happens in our society are inadequate. They are not accurate. So the numbers are staggering, and it means that we really need to rethink about the way that we think about sexual assault and sexual abuse in our community. But I'd like to give you some good news which is that between 1992 and 2010, child physical abuse seems to have gone down 56%, and child sexual abuse went down 62%. So there is hope that change can happen. I'd like you to consider the offenders themselves, because if 90% of people who, are, who have sexually abused a child were known to the child, and 75% of all women who were raped know they're rapists, it means that the, the idea that we have that it's the creepy, drooling guy in the bushes is not most, the most accurate idea. There are very few generalizations that we can make about sex offenders, but the only one that I can make with any degree of certainty is they're overwhelmingly male. We actually have very little information about female sex offenders because they are so rare. And beyond that, it's any demographic. It doesn't matter what race you are, it doesn't matter what age you are, it doesn't matter your income, doesn't matter your education. I have worked with people with developmental disabilities. I have worked with people with, um, who are hourly day laborers. I have worked with people with graduate degrees. I have worked with people who are senior military officers. There really isn't a set pattern. So again, the, the concepts we have about how sexual abuse is happening in our, in our community are not largely accurate. <coughs> When I think about the biggest surprise that I have had in, learn in doing this work, it's this. Many sex offenders can change. That was not at all what I was expecting, and if you ask me what keeps me doing this work, that's it right there. In the state of Washington, there are typically three paths that I see people go down. The first one is the wake-up call. And these are the people who have known for some time that there is something wrong with their lives, but they haven't really known quite what. And then suddenly their involvement with the criminal justice system makes them realize they are now in the worst case scenario and they need to change. And they tend to be pretty responsive to treatment because they realize that they want their lives to go in a different direction. And I've been very happy to see a number of people completely turn their lives around. The second group that tends to happen are the people that minimize their offenses. And these are the ones who come into treatment, and they know they don't belong there, and they know they didn't really have anything to do with their offense, and they're just not engaging. And this is where we as a society are doing something, to which I am profoundly glad to the state of Washington's legislature, which is that in the state of Washington, we are not a three-strike state, we are a two-strike state. If you commit a second felony sex offense in the state of Washington, you will be incarcerated for the rest of your life without possibility of release. That's how seriously we take sex offenses in the state of Washington. There is no other category of crimes where that is the case. So when I have somebody in the second group come to therapy, and after four to six weeks, they still haven't engaged and they're rolling in eye, their eyes, at some point, I may need to say something like, look, you don't have to listen to me if you don't want to. But what I can tell you is that I can help, can help you from not reoffending. And if you didn't like prison the first time, you're going to like it a whole lot less the second time because you are not getting out. And it's amazing how quickly that will engage somebody in treatment. So these, this group will not typically respond nearly as well as the first group, but they still do make some changes. The third group is in many ways the most controversial because there's the questions of victims' rights and there's the question of civil rights. And in Washington state, victims' rights went out. So there's a process that happens when we have someone who's committed a particularly heinous sex crime. When they have gotten to the end of their prison sentence, they will undergo a very thorough psychological evaluation and it includes something called a risk assessment. 
We have actuarial tables where we can estimate somebody's probability of reoffending. And so we can determine somebody's risk. And if we think somebody is too high of a risk to be returned to the community, we will do something called civil commitment. And this means that they are going to be sent to a special treatment center for an indefinite amount of time until they're psych and tr go through intensive treatment until it is believed that they can be safely returned to the community. This process can last for decades, and there is no specific end date for when this happens. This means that we are willing to commit somebody without their having necessarily committed a crime. It means that we turn into the thought police like in the movie Minority Report. This is McNeil Island, which may look like a lovely vacation spot on this picture, but this is where the Special Commitment Center is. It's the Washington State equivalent of Alcatraz. It's where we send the worst of the worst. So these buildings are all surrounded by fences that are capped with double razors of, layers of razor wire. There's really only two ways to get off of McNeil Island. The first way is that you would realize what you're missing and you decide that you're going to make the changes that you need in your life, and you undergo intensive treatment for years. You're then given psychological evaluations, and when it looks like you finally have changed enough to be able to rejoin society, you're then put through a transition process, and you are returned. The second thing that could happen is that you decide that you don't want to change or that you can't change, and you decide not to engage in treatment, and you end up remaining alone you leave McNeil Island in a body bag. If you want to find out where sex offenders are located, you can look them up in the online National Sex Offender Database. You'll find them by name, you'll find them by location, and you'll find the offense that they have been convicted of. You will be able to find out the worst thing that they have ever done to another person. But that leads me to a big question. What if there was an online database where the worst thing any of us had ever done was listed and anyone could look it up? How would you want people to think about and act towards you if they knew the worst thing you had ever done? How would you think about and act towards your friends and loved ones if you knew that about them? This difference between how you would want other people to act and think about you and if they knew the worst thing about you, and how you would act and think about a sex offender if you met them, because if you did, you would know the worst thing they have ever done, is what I think is the compassion differential. I have to work on my compassion differential every single day or I can't do my job. And some days it's worse than others, and some days that's easier than others. The people that I think of that are able to engage the best in their community are the ones who are constantly minimizing that compassion differential. There's a way in which I think we're actually not that different than the men on McNeil Island. We can decide that we don't want to fully engage in our community, and we're going to remain alone and not look at the worst part of ourselves. Or we can look at the worst part of ourselves and put in the difficult work of changing ourselves but eventually learn to teach ourselves the compassion and show it to ourselves, which we can then share with other people and fully engage in the community. Thank you for listening.